You see that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so apparently I'm, oh yeah, that's definitely on. Okay. Should we make a start then? So, uh, Drupal 8 service and dependency instruction. So, um, this is me. I'm Phil Norton, uh, technical lead at Access. You're very quiet, Phil. Am I very quiet? Yeah. I can hear myself on this, on this microphone. <laughs> Let's talk down. Um, so, technical lead at Access. I help run uh, NW Doug, which is the, which is the uh, Drupal user group in Manchester. Um, I also blog occasionally at Hashbrand Code, occasionally. Uh, and also, you can catch me on Twitter. So, um, speaking of uh, NW Doug, if you're in Manchester in November, um, then please come along to our own conference um, where you can get a great T-shirt like this. <laughs> um, but uh, if you don't know what own conference is, it's not it's not like scheduled or anything. So you just turn up and the, people, the conference the attendees give whatever talks they feel like on the day. Um, so you know, it's, there's some really uh, top quality talks last year, so uh, well worth a visit, I think. Uh, the GIF hasn't worked, for Eli. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> I, shall, I shall wait for the gift to finish. <laughs> right. So uh, you've probably seen this thing. If you haven't, um, then you might see it in the future. Uh, so this is the uh, service container in Drupal. Um, excuse me. Uh, so. I see this, when I first got into Drupal 8, I saw this thing a lot, um, and it didn't really make much sense. So you, you see things like this, like this is a Stack Overflow article, and the guy says, you know, how do I get a path for a page? And the guy says, oh, you need to use this thing. So this is Drupal service, given path. And I go, great, what does that do? Uh, out of context, it doesn't really make it as much sense. And when I first saw it, I was like baffled as to what path current is and how it works. So I'm gonna try to explain that today. Uh, there'll be lots of code, so be warned. <laughs> but I'll be posting the things on uh, slides online later, so um, you know, feel free to. And I'm here all the weekend, so uh, feel free to catch me if you need. Um, so, what are services? I'm not talking about web services. That's something completely different. These are uh, internal things that allow access to a lot of different things in Drupal 8. Um, they sort of wrap objects uh, and define a common, in common interface between these things. Um, they're automatically dependency injected. I'll come on to and cover dependency injection in its entirety later. Um, they're very powerful, so they do a lot of stuff behind the scenes that you don't need to worry about, uh, and they are certified awesome, because when I first found out about these things, I was like, okay, that's brilliant. <laughs> um, they allow access to lots of different things inside Drupal 8. So um, this is just a small selection of some of the some of the services you can get access to. So if you want to look at the config, you want to run cron or click caches or like look at um, permissions or mess around with dates, it's all in there, ready to use. Um, so how do you use it? Uh, so generally it's like this. So um, your Drupal service thing will, does that work? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, will create an object and then you can use that object to do something. So take a real world example. If you want to find out um, an alias of a path, um, you can use this. So this is the, the path alias manager. Uh, we pass in some path, get path by alias, and yeah, that's, that's all we need. Uh, so the path manager there is an instantiated object that we can use. So it's you know a, a, a usable PHP object. You can also string it all together, um, so you don't have to put it on one line uh, in different lines just to do something uh, simple. You can also, um, this is a pro tip, if you do this, so if you, if you put var and the object you want to access at the top, and then what the variable name is, you can create um, intelligence in your IDE, which helps you a lot to figure out what ins what's inside your, um, your service uh, and when you're using it, which really helps a lot. So, um, so where to find them? Um, so all services in Drupal are defined in a services.yaml file. Um, so here's an example of core.services.yaml, which is fairly extensive. Um, so your alias path manager there, uh, and you've got 
what class it points to and some arguments. Um, so if you look at the class, there it is sat in uh, path alias manager. Uh, and that's the class itself. Um, fairly, fairly standard, I guess. But uh, what's important is that, uh, sorry, the, the constructor here accepts some, some things. So you've got storage, whitelist, uh, language manager, and cache. And these are the uh, arguments in the, uh, the, the definition. So you can see each one of these contrib uh, contributes to the, uh, the constructor in some way. Um, so the, a quick note on, on types. Uh, so if you put at symbol, um, that's another service. So Drupal will instantiate that service before passing it on to the service you're looking at. Uh, you can also do um, a configuration item. So if you don't put the uh, percentage symbols in, Drupal will transfer that into a configuration uh, of some sort. Uh, and you can also pass in like a variable, so config or true or something. So you'll, you'll see that a lot inside Drupal core. Um, so uh, this means that when you instantiate the class, all these dependent objects are uh, ready to use. And this is what's called uh, dependency injection. Which, so it's a good, good point to move on to that. <coughs> so uh, dependency injection is a really complicated sounding subject. When you first look into it, it's, it's like fairly extensive. But it essentially boils down to when I instantiate an object, I don't have to worry about all the dependencies of that object. I just get the object that I need. Um, and uh, so in Drupal 8, Symfony dependency injection component manages these dependencies for you. So if you use the Symfony world, um, it's very similar to what's going on here. So rather than, rather than talk about dependency injection, I thought I'd demonstrate how useful it is. So I'm going to try to use path alias manager uh, without dependency injection. So if I instantiate the class straight away, um, this is the alias manager class. Uh, I, I see I need storage, whitelist, and language manager. So I, I can't obviously go further without doing that. So I start for storage. Uh, the alias storage class needs uh, a, a database and a module handler. So let's go from there. Um, to create the database, I get the connection from the database. And then for the module handler, uh, there's another object there, but I need to pass in root, module list, and a cache backend. So at this point, then I've got uh, root module list and cache backend, and you can see there I've made a decision. Uh, so the backend is actually a database backend, so I've had to create a database cache, which might not be actually the cache that we're using. So I've, I've you know, I've, I've cheated there by just putting in that logic there. But um, as the decision has basically been made before I've uh, even got to the the object being instantiated, and at this point I gave up because. Um, what the hell Drupal kernel and how to get that object is beyond me. <laughs> um, so at this point, you can see we've written a page of code, and I haven't even got the object ready yet. Um, and not only that, but if you drop this into your code every time you need to access the path manager, you're in a world of pain, because your code will be thousands of lines long just to produce a path. So, um, so we can boil that down to this, which is far easier and far more uh, easier to sort of follow. So what it shows, so that demonstration there shows what Drupal's doing behind the scenes, uh, but also um, shows that it integrates with decisions that your object's making. So um, if you don't have a, Drupal, a, a database cache backend, but a, like a memcache back, uh, cache backend, so twice as fast, um, what you end up doing is making decisions, and Drupal makes those decisions for you, so you don't have to worry too much about um, where the cache is coming from. I mean, this is an extreme example, obviously, but, but that's the sort of general thing that's, that goes on behind the scenes. Um, on a side note, there's also this uh, dependency injection interface. So um, any forms or controllers you use, um, they implement the interface, which is PHP uh, or speak, uh, the container injection interface, which basically means that they have to use this uh, create method, but they can be injected in, you know, with services from Drupal. Uh, so you have this static create method, which defines the service you need to inject in, into the controller or the form. Um, and you, you sort of see this sort of construct around. So you have this um, create method at the top. Uh, and you can see here we're passing in the config factory and the path alias. And then Drupal will figure that out and instantiate a, a, a config factory and a path alias manager for us. 
and the usual standard practice is to store these in, um, in properties within the object, which basically means that when we're doing something inside that class, we're not doing, we don't have to do this, we can just do this. So the, the services already are there ready for us to, to use. Um, so quick recap before going on. Uh, so services and their dependencies all defined in uh, service.yaml files. There is some other complexity there I haven't covered, um, and I'm not going to cover that today, but uh, you, I've covered the basics, or will cover the basics. So de dependency injection makes life easier. Um, controllers and forms have their own dependencies, and you can inject those in a different, slightly different way. Um, so how do we build our own? Um, now that we see that what Drupal does, uh, I can show you how to do your own stuff with it. So if you have a module, you want to create a module services for YAML file. And this is a very basic sort of um, template, but you'll see you've got services, what the service name is, uh, the class that it points to, and any arguments you want to pass in as well. Um, again, going to service argument types, you've got that symbol, which sort of constitutes another service. Uh, you've got a configuration item or some sort of variable. So if we, st if we create a, an object that looks like this, we can see the config factory is actually the, uh, the service that allows us access to the, con uh, the config. Uh, and, this is, um, and this is the class we're going to make. So it's, uh, before we make the class first, we need to make an interface. <coughs> I'll comment about how interfaces are important later on, but basically they, ride, they allow easy, easy overriding in the future and ensure that any, any past dependencies uh, conform to an interface and not just a class. Um, or revisit this in a bit, bit so uh, bear with me. But this is the class. Um, so you can see we're passing in uh, the config factory interface. And instead of just storing the whole config factory, what we're doing is going into the config factory and picking out the config from the module itself. Uh, and that's it. So then we can start using it. Pretty simple. Um, it's a silly example, obviously, but um, you know that's the basic template of creating a service in your own module. So let's move on to some real examples. So for a recent project, we built um, PCA Predict uh, interface. Who, who's heard of PCA Predict? It used to be called uh, Postcode Anywhere until they changed the name until this strange marketing thing. But um, so it's used for address matching and autocompleting forms. So you can get a user to fill out uh, their postcode you can match that to an address. So what we do is integrate with the PCA Predict web service, uh, and we created a Drupal service to wrap that web service. So um, what we did then was to create this uh, PCA Predict service. So this is the, in the services, uh, PCA Predict services YAML file, um, and that's all we needed, really. Uh, then we create an interface. So what we need to do is define two different ways of accessing the API, which is find and, re and retrieve. Um, and then our instantiated class uh, takes in the config factory, loads the PCA predict key from that factory, and then we've got access to find and retrieve things. So you can see that our, our object implements, implements that interface that we've defined, so it has to uh, adhere to find and retrieve. And <coughs> um, we store the API key in the property, basically. That means we can do stuff like this. So we can pass in a postcode and get results, so we can find an easy list of res uh, results. Um, and that's about it. So you can see, I'm not going to talk about the, the complexities of the uh, Postcode Anywhere API, but we've written the service. So all we need to do to access that API anywhere in our application is just to write this single line of code, which um, saves you sort of time and effort, basically. So now that we have services, uh, one great, great thing about Drupal services and a Drupal services uh, um, component is that you can alter them, uh, which provides a lot more uh, sort of future-proofing and complexity. So um, I'm going to look at three case studies about what we did here. But basically, all services inside the application can be overridden and altered in some way. Um, there's a, a service provider class that allows this, uh, which are uh, automatically detected by Drupal. Um, so what you need to do is, if you if you have a class that needs to override a service, you create this thing called service provider um, with a camel case version of the name, 
Uh, so let's have a look at some examples of this in action. And I'll show you exactly what I mean there. <laughs> so um, who's used the Shield module? It's a pre pretty good module. Uh, it provides a sort of basic authentication layer in front of your website. Um, really useful sort of keeping uh, like Google, basically, out of your staging sites and things. One of the problems is that uh, it also blocks the access to the API. Uh, or if you, so if you have an API inside Drupal, you need to authenticate against the Shield module and then authenticate against the API, which tends to be a little bit complicated uh, for APIs to manage. So basically what we did is poke a hole in the Shield. So we allow access to the API endpoint through the Shield module. So create a module called Shield Override. Um, we convert the module name to camel case. So in that case, Shield Override becomes Shield Override. We prefix it, uh, suffix with the words service provider. Oh, so our, our, our class then becomes Shield Override Service Provider. And we stick that in our source directory of the module. That's basically, so the, these are the only files needed for that module, basically. So our, our service provider provides this alter class, uh, also mod, alter method, sorry. Um, and what that does is basically the container then contains a list of all the services that you can see inside Drupal. And what we do is we get the, the Shield middleware um, service, which is the service that, that um, Shield uses to provide the authentication. And we override it with our own Shield override uh, class. It's, uh, this, this, um, this class also provides a register thing, so you can dynamically register services, but I can't see how that's useful. So it even says that on the Drupal website. It says, uh, this, is our, this is very rare, so <laughs> don't worry too much about that. Um, so this is our Shield Override module, uh, sorry, Shield Override class. And you can see that it actually extends the Shield middleware uh, module, sorry, class. Uh, so it provides all the, the basic functionality that, that does. And what most of this is to do is um, if, if our current method is post or get and we're looking at our, this is a SOAP service, then we handle the service, uh, handle the request in a normal way that Drupal would handle it. So basically without authentication. If we don't pass through this, then we just go parent handle, which then calls the original um, shield module um, class, which basically means that it's authenticated. Does that make sense? So we've, we've poked holes in a shield straight away by, written, by writing a couple lines of code. We didn't have to fill around with much. Um, and basically these are, these are per, I guess, uh, per project um, classes that we create. Um, but it allows us to sort of, on the staging site, like have a staging um, API endpoint as well. So there we are. Uh, so another one. Um, so we built the PCA predict module, uh, but in order to use the PCA predict module, you need to spend money. So I think every transaction is like two pence or something, so it's not a lot, but if you're testing and refining your UI processes, that becomes a lot of money over a few days of like continuously um, you know, using that, that form when you don't have to. So what we did is create the stub module. Um, so the stub sub, uh, service that doesn't use the API system so again, um, we created a PCA predict stub, uh, convert the module to camel case, so PCA predict stub becomes PCA predict stub, uh, and then suffix it with the word service provider, so it then becomes that. We then have our, our three classes here, so uh, two classes. So basically we've got a service provider here, and we've got a, 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 a stub module, that's sort of a subclass, sorry that looks, at, looks like the original uh, class from the original module. So what a stub service provider does is it gets a definition of PCA predict and it replaces it with our PCA predict stub uh, class. Make sense? So basically instead of, uh, so w what we're doing here is we're using the interface, which means that we have to define a find and retrieve method. Um, so that makes it easy, so we can we can uh, verify that we've got all of our uh, API endpoints covered. But essentially, it means that we can go from using the API to using CSV files or something just by turning a module on. And uh, we use a system called config split. Um, so when we deploy onto a staging site, 
it automatically in, uh, config syncs against the, the staging environment config and turns on this module. So we're not using any of the sort of uh, any of the live APIs <coughs> on that site. That make sense. So, so stub modules actually uh, are really useful. Uh, useful, useful for um, preventing analytics, analytics from being sent. So um, recently I was working with an analytics package called uh, Mixpanel, and uh, instead of triggering, triggering the events to the Mixpanel API, I created a little stub module just to write the API triggers into the log, so I can see that what was getting, what was getting um, hit and things, but basically means that we're not polluting the live analytics system with staging data or development data. Um, you can biplex complex setups and firewalls. So um, if you've got a, a, an API that sits in a, a VPN and you know, not many people have access to that VPN, then what you can do is, is turn on a stub module that allows your testers or um, your front-end developers, for example, to uh, create an interface against that um, without using the API itself. Uh, so you just sort of mock the data inside that. Um, I find this very useful, uh, especially with complex setups, um, just to sort of get people started when they're, when they're using the project. Uh, you can also test without actually using the API. Um, so you can turn on, the, turn on the stub module whilst you're in the test mode and you know the input-output methods that you've got. Um, so, <coughs> last example, slightly more complicated thing. Uh, so we created. I'll, I'll, I'll actually, yeah, I'll just continue. So, so we used the group module recently um, to manage members on a website. Uh, we then created a view to show all the group members uh, and some information about them. We added some AJAX filters to allow uh, that user list to be filtered in some way, and so the group context um, was loaded into the view using context filter path. Um, so let me explain what's going on here. So this is our uh, this is our path. So we've got uh, count one to three members. So mem uh, views automatically picks up one two three as the group ID and loads that in the context of the view. So then we only show um, basically the people that are in their group on this view. What was happening though was that when people were entering email address uh, into here and clicking filter, it was coming back with access denied message. And the reason that was is because behind the scenes, the Ajax wrapper looks like this. It doesn't match that at all. So by the time it gets into views, views has no idea what this is and kicks back an access denied message. So uh, buried inside the group module is a module is a class responsible for this. Um, and what this does is, is basically loads the, uh, the group from the context that it has. So you can see here, get, get group, group from root um, is used. So if if the group uh, if this context uh, class doesn't know how to load that group, it doesn't load the group, and so views doesn't know what's going on upstream upstream because it's the access um, to the group that's checked upstream. So it needs to have that object in place. Uh, and I can see inside the group module that this uh, class is actually defined in the service which means that I had uh, a mechanism there to be able to actually override that and solve this problem. So I created this uh, group view service provider uh, in the same way as before. So group views is my, is my uh, module name and uh, basically uh, gave it this override class. So this override class is uh, fairly weird looking, but uh, let's look at the important bits. So it just extends the root context uh, from groups, so it doesn't do anything anything on, uh, on top of that. Uh, it then checks to make sure, and this is a lot of checks to make sure <laughs> that we're actually looking at the right context. So this is the right group. Uh, sorry, this is the right view. Um, it's sort of the the right display type. We're looking at an AJAX request. It looks like a group ID inside the the post args, that kind of thing. Um, we then <coughs> load the group into our. Uh, into the context for the uh, the group needs that this this class needs, and then we continue on as normal. So we just uh, do everything that it used to have, and that basically solved the problem. So where I was able to uh, load the group in the right context and present it to the view, which then goes, "All right, is this group? 
here's, here's the thing. Um, obviously, I could have solved this by um, putting a patch into the uh, group module, but um, this, this appeared to be like a, a custom situation for us, so that made sense at the time. Um, if you want to look at any resources, uh, we've, so the, the Drupal actually uh, has a lot of um, documentation on this. So you can look up the, like the, the, the root container sort of thing. Um, there's a list of all the services available. So this is actually quite a good list of, I showed you a, a small snippet of that. There's hundreds of other services available in Drupal 8. So uh, go and have a look. Um, there's also pretty good uh, documentation on, on how to use all this stuff that I've just talked about. Uh, uh, just sort of pimp the um, NWDOGUM conference again. <laughs> Uh, if you're in uh, Manchester on the second Tuesday of the month, we also have a user group, so uh, please come along and feel free to ask me questions and things. Uh, none of us, I don't think, dress like this. But <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, any questions? Have I lost everybody in the first five minutes? So. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, do So you're right in that you can build, uh, so the question was about what, what benefits does this give you basically. So you're right in that um, you can create a third party library to create a PCA predict interface and do all the sort of quirky um, auditory and stuff that way. But if you want to override that inside your application or change that in any way, then you're sort of stuck with the, with the, the that implementation of it. <coughs> Plus, um, you don't, you don't, have, uh, you don't uh, get all the tools for the dependency injection, so you need to make sure that you're passing the right arguments to that object beforehand to get everything ready and ready and going. So, usual practice is to is to download the library using you know, Composer or whatever and have it within the system somewhere, but then have an interface inside your module that will instantiate the class and do whatever it needs to do to get that up and running, um, and that, that'll provide you a little hook to sort of alter that in any way. So, if you want to swap it out for CSV file you can do, um, but it basically means you're not you're not relying on the underlying class. You can swap out that implementation if you like. So yeah, just by changing the the, the service provider you've got inside your module. That yeah okay. I was thinking I solved that wrong. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other matter? Yeah, I've been working with the Drupal console module. I just wanted to know. I haven't tried, but uh, is it possible to generate? Services, files, skeletons with the Google console module? I'm sure it must be. Yeah. Anybody know? I think so. It's in a trend. We haven't tried it yet, but right. if I work with it for forms and for different other yeah. kind of objects, and it works quite well for generating skeletons. So yes. I'm assuming perhaps for uh, the services uh, modules and files as well. I'm sure you must be able to. I mean, but then again, it's it's not not a lot of code to set up a services class. And yeah, it does. Um, but, um, but you have to have your module set. Yeah, it does. Before, yeah. Okay. It does. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, right. Well, I'm here all weekend. Um, if you need to catch hold of me uh, and go through any examples or anything, but um, thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just because I didn't have time to maintain the. Uh, yeah, yeah, because it was you and.
Dan, I know Dan from um, Big Band, but I know yeah. Kelly Bristol. Yeah. yeah, I'm around the corner from you now in Manchester as well. I've never okay. been there, actually, but I uh, work at Reason Digital. Oh, yeah. I think so. With, with, with um, Nathan? Yes. Nathan. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. been alongside, yeah. So I'm hopefully, I'm up. The signs on us to not to coincide with the Doug show. Yeah. At some point, I'll be up. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. Have a good one. Yeah, what's the service? Service? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I have a question. What, what service and what people? Is this a community or is it code? I'm not sure. Or maybe it's a hybrid. So it's like the X-Men, you know, where you say code and community and you inject code into the community. Ah, it's funny to inject into the community. Ah. Yeah, yeah, I like it, guys. Very good. We're all dependent on each other. Mm. Uh, so I need to ask my question. Oh, that's all right. It's quite hard to link intelligence to people. Intelligence is just people. <laughs> oh, use my technique. Lost a bit. I understood why you wanted to do the whole code sub thing, but I understand how you'd want to inject that information um, to the one that's money, but I, I didn't quite get how you planned the actual placement. Maybe I didn't quite have the content, or maybe it's just in the tool. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. So thi this is okay, yeah, yeah. So this is original code, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, so okay. So we basically just we show us showing the package and the yeah. that that people can actually use. Okay, yeah. So everybody can see the package. Yeah, but um, so the okay, so the you're extending. It, 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 this is not the same class. No, yeah. so this these, is these just classes. This is so uh, these classes are automatic extensions of each other. Yeah. So it's like a it's a short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so these people could have read it and have uh, a lower case content. Yeah. The content is built in for each class. Yeah. But this is a, this is just to get the ultimate. Okay, so do all services have an author? Because I've written services, but I've never done an actual no, project. This is an actual extension built in for each class. So this is just a class. So the, and that's just the service the provider, okay, so service provider base provides an author method. Is that right? Sounds like it. Is it an, an author method? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And that author method allows me to inject the replacement class. Okay, that's that's easy then. Yeah, okay, I didn't know that. Is there anything you say needs that you can adjust by adding the extra content to it? writing services because I know this would be possible but I didn't know I, I never had a case where I actually needed to replace them so yeah so this this one has to be the original code so it doesn't have to be the yeah 
because there's an endless y- loop that you can take every day to start with. So I, I like the so idea. So it's just a matter of taking it one day at a time. Can I take a, a screenshot of this uh, of this um, <laughs> of this tab just to, to remind me? Because they all they, they're all basically the same idea and I don't think they're that different. <laughs> no, that's the thing you kind of forget about that. But that's quite an interesting idea. Obviously, it prevents you from being stuck in one thing. But but is it? Oh, just uh, okay. And, and then it goes into other things. So is it is it the same? Is that true? Because it's not the same thing. Yeah. It, it, it remembers yeah. the object that it's, 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 it
Otherwise, otherwise, you're, you're running out of memory and no Christmas flat to keep yeah. the generational bazillion of debt yeah. for everything. And I think this is a question of whether we we perhaps we have an important impact that don't get stuck in paper in terms of service to the community. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like everything. Really, really, really mean it. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> well, there you go. That's the opposite of what I would say. Oh my God! If we could suddenly just have the flexible economy of the world to make things much cheaper and things like that, why would we need to be doing that? Why can't we find that in the sort of the wider well, economy of the world? Basically, these questions, when you can really understand them, that that because of the danger in sharing too many things at the same time, um, but if you can understand that. If it did change, you didn't care about it in that way. Then it would make perfect sense to arrange the contents of that file into a separate data that you would only run the files when you know that you've just hacked it, and then you can't go back and hack it. Yeah. That's a it's fairly yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's a separate it's function. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't realise that. No, 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 no but they're both interesting. They're both static function in the context of work is an unusual one. So you can just say, you know, Bruce at colon colon serves thing is a factory file that takes things and does all the right things to return you an input for a thing. So that's why it's called a factory because it makes things. Yeah. I see. Cool. So that's the usual use of static functions. You can use them in other ways. The other way that sometimes you use them is as a separate function is when you've got potentially you've got a class number which is um, it really doesn't care about any of the class but it is related to the class it's doing something that's class relevant but the only inputs it wants to take note of are parts of the programming code and the only output the only effect it has Well, no, no, you, so you could write that as a more and more non-static function. So then you'd have to pass every string and every option, and you'd have to keep loads of privileges and stuff with loads of things, um, and all that kind of stuff. But then actually, it's quite completely relevant because it doesn't need it. Okay, so like every time you say get something, then you it's never going to change anything. Yeah, and if you're returning a fixed name string that's never different from the return string, then that. Would 